Good evening, everyone. Thank you all, you all for staying back uh, at this time, uh, which is 5 p.m. in Malaysia. And today's my topic will be on the updates of adjunct therapy in epilepsy treatments. But I will focus uh, mainly on parent panel uh, with some introductions to uh, other drugs as well. So let me start with a case of focal epilepsy. This is a 33 years old man, seizures onset from 26 with uh, temporal lobe semiology, which he has lip smacking, or sometimes we call oral ot automatisms and uh, left hand dystonia and right dis automatisms, which is consistent with uh, right temporal lobe seizures. And his EG show uh, right anterior temporal discharges, MRI show right mesial temporal sclerosis, as you can see on the right uh, with uh, T2 images, as well as the EG on the right lower corner. His HLA-B1502 was negative, and that's why we started uh, carbamazepine titrated up to 400 B milligram BD, but uh, which caused drowsiness. He still have seizures uh, two uh, per month, despite uh, 400 milligram BD of carbamazepine. So why is the seizures not controlled? There are usually many causes. This is how I practice. Uh, whenever someone's seizures are not controlled, we'll go through this list again. Uh, firstly, is it the diagnosis is wrong or is it generalized seizures? That's why I'm not responding to carbamazepine. Or is the dose not enough? Or is the patient non-compliance? Or is the patient uh, actually didn't increase the dose because of drowsiness? You know, patient de developed drowsiness uh, when he had 400 milligram BD. He may he he may himself reduce the dose, and uh, or is it lifestyle factors whereby he he may have stress or sleep deprivations, or in fact the epilepsy is resistance and uh, not responding not responding to current medications or uh, there are some progressive pathology. And of all these possible explanations, uh, the likelihood is that the seizures is, respond, is not responding to carbamazepine or refractory or resistance to carbamazepine. And we should consider either increased dose, but he will have drowsiness or try another newer medications. So in year 2000, Union Journals, Patrick Kwan and Martin Brody has uh, published this famous paper with which we know that uh, 47 plus 13 plus 4%, which is about 60% uh, response to treatment, but there are about one third dozen response. And a lot of times these patients are on polytherapy, almost half of them. And because of that, there is a new classification definitions of drug resistance. And for the drug resistance definitions, firstly, we must know that they must have a adequate trial of at least two medications which are tolerated. So if the medications are not tolerated at a very small dose, we don't include them as uh, the one of the two uh, ADs in the drug resistance definitions. And they must be appropriately chosen. Like in this case, if the patients were given sodium valproate and not responsive, uh, we don't count the sodium valproate. And the aim is to achieve sustained seizure freedom for at least one year. So if there is persistent uh, seizures despite treatment, then this is considered not responsive. This is our Malaysian cohort, which was uh, published last year in the Neurology Asia. And uh, what we are trying to show is that in our cohort, 70% are focal epilepsy, 40% are refractory, which is not responding to the at least two AEDs. And out of this, 40% uh, has surgical evaluations and 60% have surgery. At the end, only uh, there are 24 of them achieve seizure freedom with surgery out of this 647 cohort. And we can see that the number of previous AD at the x-axis on the right graph is showing that the more the ADs we try, the less likely that the patient will achieve seizure freedom. And this chart is corresponding to 
60% responsiveness uh, if the patient is not on any AEDs. This is uh, similar to the published results in Neurology 2008, showing about 60%, uh, which, is, uh, which will achieve seizure freedom if they are not on any previous AED before. For those who uh, measure 50% reduction in seizure freedom in the chart B, then uh, what we are talking about is 80 to 90% of the patients will persist, but uh, will be less than 50% from what they have without anti epileptic drugs. So, what are the new drugs that we are talking about? You know, there are many trials uh, and many developments. And these are the third generations that we are looking into after the year 2010, which is about 10 years from now. So in the past 10 years, we have lacosamide, we have reticabin, but which was withdrawn from the markets because of discolorations. We have parent panel. And these are the newer agents, which are only in the markets within the past 10 years. So to choose the best uh, adjunct therapy or what is the next adjunct therapy, we, I list out five uh, principles for you uh, to guide your practice. The first one is efficacy. If you look at the, the graph on the left side, the left side are comparing those who has achieved seizure freedom. Whereas the graph on the right are comparing those who have achieved 50% seizure reductions. And we look at the dose on the top are uh, enzyme inducer, and mostly uh, the carbamazepine was used as a comparator. So the top half is enzyme inducers, the lower half are non enzyme inducers. And we can see that the non enzyme inducers or the newer medications, in fact, achieve almost similar seizure freedom rate. If you look at the red uh, diamond on the top and below, as well as almost uh, similar 50% seizure reductions on the right uh, charts. So what it means is that, you know, no matter how many new medications, the efficacy of them are almost the same as uh, the older agents like carbamazepine. This, uh, this is a very interesting network method analysis. When we talk about network meta analysis, it's not only looking at the response rate itself, it looks at the number of patients. It also looks at the strength. So the every line uh, surrounding the circles indicate the strength of the correlations. And the thicker the bar is, indicate stronger strength or stronger correlations. And you can see that the parent panel uh, is almost similar to other AEDs. For example, those with similar square like oxcarbazepine, levitiracetam, sonisamide, and topiramids. Those are the groups with stronger uh, response in terms of 50% responder rates. Talk about retention rate. Most often we know that carbamazepine retention rate is low because of the side effect. So the more retention rate is low because of the responsiveness. It's less responsive for especially for focal epilepsy. Whereas lamotrigine in the long run has a higher retention rate because of the gentleness of minimal or less side effects of lamotrigines if we manage to titrate the dose gradually. In the initial trial for parent panel, the treatment retention rate is 88%. But what we are interested in are the long-term uh, retention rates. So this is a data on one-year responder rate, which is an open label uh, uh, trial compared to the phase three double blind trials. So during the double blind study, the responder rate, which is uh, within the first two to three months, is only about 34%. But 
but we know that some patients are on lower dose uh, of parenpanil and therefore the response the response or the responding rate is much lower. Whereas during the open label phase, patients are allowed to increase their dose uh, to try to achieve a better seizure control. And with an increased dose, uh, the, we managed to achieve almost 50% uh, responder rate out of those who maintain and continue in the maintenance of open label trial. In this case, a lot of them are actually titrated up to 10 to, or 12 milligram, in which 12 milligram is the maximum dose of uh, parenpanil in the study. So, if we compare the efficacy per protocol, per protocol means that we include everyone, including those who have uh, stopped uh, parenpanil during the trial, then the efficacy is about 30%. But if you are looking at those who can tolerate the side effect and continue using the uh, parent panel, which are the completers, then the efficacy of 50% respond, responder rate is about 40%. These are our paper on Asian subjects. We show almost similar uh, results. In terms of seizure reductions, there are 30% reduced reduction in seizure frequency, or at least 40% who have achieved 50% uh, responder responding rate, responding rate to uh, parenpanil, which is similar to the pool data over the whole uh, world. But more interestingly is that there there are some reason first add-on therapy. You know, in the past, all the trials are on people who has failed maybe two or three anti epileptic drugs, and they are very refractory. And we, from our previous uh, slides, we know that for those who have failed two or three AADs or even four or five, the likelihood of responding to the newer AADs is very low. However, what if uh, if we add parenpanil as the first add-on therapy. These are the group of patients who has more than one seizure per month and uh, has less than three AED monotherapy trial before. And if we add the parenpanil early, then the responder rate is much higher. So firstly, there are 60% for the generalized epilepsy achieved seizure freedom. So the green one is for seizure freedom. The blue bar is for responder rate, which is 93.8% for generalized epilepsy. And very this is consistent with our knowledge on generalized epilepsy, whereby higher number of them will achieve seizure freedom, even with the first AEDs. Whereas for focal epilepsy, 40% achieve seizure freedom and 82% achieve 50% uh, 50, 50 reductions. This is uh, very important to, to know. If to know that the efficacy of parenpanil is greater if you add uh, them much earlier. On the right, there are two charts. Chart A are on those comparing with enzyme inducers. All right, so the black bar, the black bar are those who are on enzyme inducers, for example, on carbamazepine or phenytoin or oxcarbazepine. Whereas chart B are those who are adding enzyme inhibitors, for example, epilim, sodium warpate, or depakin in some uh, country. And you can see a very marked difference. The first one is without enzyme inducer, which is the white bar. The black bar is enzyme inducer. So without enzyme inducer, the seizure freedom rate is much higher, 59% as compared to 40% here. This is almost 50%. Responder rate also go up to 84% with, without enzyme inducers. But the main difference is the seizure freedom rate. 
Whereas for those with enzyme inhibitors, for example, sodium valproate, the respondent rate or seizure freedom rate is also significantly higher. Looking at the black uh, bar over here, up to 68%. So what it means is that Prampanil has a drug-drug interaction with enzyme-inducing or enzyme-inhibiting drugs. So enzyme-inducer will reduce the efficacy of Prampanil, whereas enzyme inhibitors has an impact on the uh, seizure outcome. So if you look back from the beginning, the efficacy of all those who are in the trial is only about 30%. But if they can tolerate the medications and complete the trial, the responder rate is 40%. If we push the dose higher to 10 or 12 milligrams, and they can still tolerate uh, the uh, pamperenil, the responder rate will go up to 50%. But if we have early add-on, then it can, we can achieve 80 to 90% of our responder rate. This is talking about 50% seizure reductions. And comparing the 12 months retention rate, as I mentioned in the graph just now, we can see that the retention rate for first add-on, if we add on Tampanil earlier, almost 90% of the patients choose to retain or to keep Tampanil as their anti epileptic drugs. And the green bar here, which is first add-on, is Pampanil plus only one anti-seizure drugs. Rest late add-on are those who have already tried two or three or more. And then we only add on Pampanil, the retention rate will be less. This may not be because of the side effect. Sometimes it's because of the efficacy. How about tolerability? You know, when we started use Pampanil, a lot of our patients complain these two key side effects. There are many other side effects, but dizziness and somnolence are the two main uh, side effects that uh, patients are concerned. They feel dizzy, especially after taking the parenteral, or they feel sleepy. Not if, although they are taking it at night before sleep, they feel somnolence the next morning. They always complain that, you know, they find it difficult to wake up uh, from bed the next morning. So it become a concern initially when we first try uh, using parent panel. But nowadays we realize that these side effects are related to dose. Two milligram, the tolerance of side effect uh, rate is about 61%. 12 milligram, it go up to 89%. And uh, some of these are minor, some are major side effects. As you can see here, these are the severe and serious adverse events, which are uh, rate up to 8 to 15%. And because of side effect, there are about 20% which will withdraw uh, from the study because of the intolerability to parent panel. And the most common side effect, as we talk about, is dizziness and somnolence. And another one, which are commonly reported, is irritability. So patients complain about uh, agitations, about getting angry easily with parenteral. This is very similar to those on levy tiracetam. So the irritability concerns is also there with parenteral. And we, once again, we can see that for those who are on higher dose and 12 milligram, the rate is higher. So how can we overcome this? You know, can we uh, reduce the possibility of having adverse event with a certain regime? Answer is yes. First of all, if we can titrate the medications slower, in this case, the green, the green bar are those who titrate more than 2 mg every 2 weeks, which means they increase from 2 to 4 to 6 to 8 every 2 weeks. Whereas for those in the uh, orange color bar, 
their titrate slower. Either they increase one milligram every two weeks or two milligram every three to four weeks. So the slow titration group has much lower adverse event, which means if we want the patient to tolerate perimperineal better, we have to titrate it slower. And in uh, my clinic practice or in Malaysia, when I talk to many other neurologists, they choose to titrate initially uh, one milligram every two weeks. So they increase the dose much slower than the initial trial did. So one milligram every two weeks or two milligram every four weeks will re result in lower rate of adverse event, which includes sedation, unsteadiness, and the behavioral disturbance, for example, irritability. After this, you know, we know that parenteral can be effective, especially if we add on earlier, can have a lot of adverse events, but this can be reduced with slower titrations. We also need to know what is what are the other benefits of uh, the newer AEDs. You know, when someone doesn't respond to carbamazepine, pinitoin, what else can we use and why are these uh, medications different from the older one? The first reason is because all these newer medications, for example, parampanil, reticobine, meritiracetam, and lacosamides, they have different mechanism of actions. Lacosamide is different from carbamazepine, although it's working at uh, sodium on at the uh, sodium channels, but it's actually at uh, functioning at the slow inactivation uh, pathway rather than the fast activations inactivations like carbamazepine. Whereas uh, larytiracetam is pre-synaptic and parenpanin and reticabin are post-synaptic, whereby parenpanin itself, as you can see the name, contain a word called AMPA, A -M -P -A, whereby the AMPA is a glutamate receptor or AMPA receptor, and AMPA receptor is post-synaptic. This is a very busy drug, but what I'm trying to show you is looking at the newer or third generation anti epileptic drugs. Many of them has newer uh, mechanism of actions as we can see on top. So beside the benefits of having newer uh, mechanism or novel mechanisms, we can also look at their pharmacokinetics and think why we want to use or in which anti-epileptic drugs that we prefer if the older one uh, doesn't work. All this while, when the phenytoin first came out, it is so amazing because phenytoin is having a long uh, half-life and can be given on a daily basis. So patients only take it once a day. So although we know, we know that phenytoin can cause sleepiness uh, and dizziness, patients, if they take it before sleep, for example, 300 milligram of phenytoin uh, on sleep, they experience much less side effect if compared to those who are taking it uh, in the daytime. So some patients, some, some doctors are giving phenytoin at 100 milligram TDS. This uh, is not uh, advisable because it has a higher tendency to cause side effect in the daytime. The best dose is 300 milligram on night. But after phenytoin, we don't have any other medications which can be given daily. There is no others like carbon mesopine, lamotrigine, levetiracetam, and topiramids. A lot of them, their half-life are much shorter. Although the lamotrigine is long, but it's not advisable to give daily dose because daily dose means that we need to give higher dose. And higher dose of lamotrigine uh, has a tendency to cause Steven Johnson. And therefore, there is, most of them are either give, begin, being given BD or TPS dose. Until zonisamide and parampanil, this came again to the new era where the newer medications can be, can be given at daily 
uh, formulations. And this daily dose help many patients to adapt or to tolerate their side effect, especially if they're taking it at night. So daily uh, dosing is one of the great advantage, especially for those who cannot tolerate the side effects. The last one is specific syndrome. We know that juvenile mild chronic epilepsy responds to uh, sodium vaporate very well. So sodium vaporate is the first choice, but uh, there are many concerns nowadays, especially to uh, the female, the mainly the childbearing age uh, females. If they are pregnant, then there are teratogenicity rate, uh, risk. If the, for the baby, there are neurodevelopmental effects where baby with mother on Walpret uh, have lower IQ. Whereas we understand from our experience that Lariteracetam and Lamotrigine, their responder rate to, uh, on juvenile chronic epilepsy are not as great. We know often that only about 60% responds to Lariteracetam or Lamotrigine. Although there are a very low teratogenicity risk, but the efficacy is not as great as sodium vaporate. Topiramix has teratogenicity as well. Our patient can have cleft, cleft leaf or cleft uh, palate. Whereas other options to think about is zonisamide and pampanil. So this is a small study, only 81 patients uh, on placebo and panel, but it showed that there is about 60% uh, responder rate on those with panel. So this becomes another option. If someone doesn't work or doesn't respond to levitiracetam or lamotrigine. So uh, at least in brief, for Jonah Malchronic Epilepsy, if the patient can tolerate or suitable for Waprate, we'll use sodium Waprate. If not, levitiracetam or lamotrigine. If they didn't respond, then these are the options to think about and parent panel is one of them. For lennox gastrot syndrome, you know, we know that lennox gastrot is a very refractory epilepsy. Most often, it doesn't respond to many uh, different uh, medications. And is parent panel suitable or can parent panel be considered? Answer is yes. The answer is up to 64.8% have 50% uh, seizure reductions with uh, parenpanil. Just remember, this is an open-label trial. Uh, currently, there is a clinical trial ongoing on double-blind randomized trial uh, using parenpanil in Lennox gastrot syndrome, but this has not been completed yet. Another subgroup of epilepsy, which are also very refractory, which is progressive myoclonic or myoclonus epilepsy, and sometimes they are with ataxia, or sometimes we call them progressive myoclonic syndrome. This is a combination of multiple genetic uh, uh, syndrome, which I won't go through all, just to let you know that there are many different genetic types. Not all genetic types respond to parenpanel in this small uh, study uh, case series, but at least some of them response to uh, parent panel, in which the black color are the score for mild chronic jerk, and the black color indicate a better response for their mild chronic. Okay, so in conclusion, what I'm saying is that for those with refractory epilepsy, especially focal epilepsy, in this in this lecture include uh, generalized epilepsy as well. Parent panel is effective as adjunct therapy, but consider early add-on. If we add on too late, the efficacy may not be as great. And when we use our parent panel, we try to either reduce or stop all the enzyme inducer like carbamazepine, if we can stop or reduce it, the efficacy of parent panel will go up. Some uh, study promote a combination with sodium vaporate, which I personally have not tried that before, uh, but this can be considered if the 
patients are worried about cost. So instead of four, eight milligram or 10 milligram per panel, this is another consideration. Uh, using lower dose of pan panel like 4 milligram together with sodium valproate, but I personally have not tried that. The second point is side effect, and remember the side effect can be reduced by slow titrations. And the, my practice is 1 milligram every two weeks, at least from 1 milligram to 4 milligram, I titrate them very slowly. After a patient uh, achieves 4 milligram of dose, then we may uh, increase the titration rate later, but at least in the beginning, I titrate much uh, slower. Parampanil has a good uh, new me mechanism, which is on MPA receptor. So if you are using it together with glutamate receptors, or those who are working on sodium channel, or those who are working on uh, SV2A, or like Levitiracetam, then they are working at different mechanisms. And thus, it may indicate or it suggests that panpanil is suitable as adjunct therapy in those instances. Yes, a long half-life can be given once a day, and this is a benefit to many patients, especially those who have a sleeping problem. Panpanil will really help them to sleep well at night. And lastly, in a very specific syndrome, especially some of our juvenile malchronic epilepsy, which are very refractory to uh, levitiracetam and lemotrichin. I consider uh, parampanil in them. And other conditions are like Lennox-Gastaut syndrome and progressive myoclonic epilepsy. So uh, I'd like to let you know that we have a lecture on epilepsy surgery on 20th of March, which is Saturday. So if the patient doesn't respond to the treatment, then we should go on and consider surgery and the lecture will be on Saturday. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Dr. Lim Keng Siang, um, for a, a very uh, excellent lecture about um, updates on the adjunctive uh, treatment for epilepsy treatment. I have a question. Um, you know the side effects of irritability, and um, you've mentioned there if we do a combination of parampanel and uh, levetiracetam, it's actually quite a good combination. Do you see... Um, the impact of, you know, with Kepra, they also get irritable. And do you see any sort of worsening irritability or more irritability if they're combined together in your practice? Uh, first of all, if we have already started levitiracetam and the patient develop irritability, then we shouldn't combine with parampanil. But if they are on levitiracetam but doesn't have irritability, then in those cases, I will still consider parampanil. And if irritability occur after the combinations, I will reduce the parampanil first because I would think that the parampanil is the culprit for irritability. I see. Okay, thank you. We have some questions, with Prof. So I'll start with the first one. Uh, Prof, if seizure control is well achieved after add-on with parampanel, shall I maintain some dose of both uh, anti-epileptic epi uh, anti drugs or shall I increase dose of parampanel while weaning off first anti-epileptic drug? Mm -hmm. So I assume this patient's already on first uh, AD. Now, parampanil is the second one. Technically, if someone responds to the second AD, in this case, parampanil, there are two explanations. The first explanation is the seizure is controlled by parampanil alone. The second explanation is the seizure is controlled by the combinations. But technically speaking, if the first one doesn't work, then we know that it's unlikely to be the second explanations whereby combinations work. So in this case, if the parent patient is already on parent panel, for example, six milligram and it works, we know that six milligram is adequate. So it's okay to reduce the first one, but don't need to increase the second one. We can keep the same dose of parent panel and wait unless seizure get worse, 
then only increase later. Okay, that's very clear. Thank you, Prof. The next question, how likely is perampanil to cause serious psychiatric and behavioral changes in patients given its black box warning? Yeah, in our, in our uh, uh, clinical trial, Asian study, as well as our own analysis in uh, Malaysia, in Malaysia, we have in fact collected uh, prime panel uh, cases from other uh, hospitals together with Unistim Malaya as well. The side, the serious side effect rate is almost reach uh, ten to fifteen percent. Mm. So we have to always remind the family or the patients to report to us if they develop serious uh, behavioral changes, especially on those with learning disability or autism that become very hyperactive or irritable. Mm. Okay, thank you, Prof. The next question, um, is Parampanel used in Dravet syndrome and what is the response rate? Thank you. Yeah, I, I didn't include this in, I didn't include Dravet as the as uh, in the in my lecture, answer is yes, it has been used, and the responder rate is about the same as Lennox just thought. We are not talking about super high uh, responder rate. Mm. Okay. Um, good evening, Prof. I would like to ask, is there any monitoring in terms of uh, TDM level or blood parameters for parampanel? Um, is it safe in pregnancy and breastfeeding? Thank you, Prof. So uh, TDM was done during uh, the clinical trial. So all our patients who are on the double blind and open label study, they have parent panel drug level monitoring. And we have compared the drug level in Asian comparing to the white which are Caucasians. What happened, what we found from our analysis is that the parent panel pharmacokinetics between Asian and Caucasians are similar. First point. Second point is parent panel pharmacokinetics are stable. So it's not fluctuating. And that's why uh, there is no need to do uh, parent panel monitoring or TDM in clinical practice. It was only done in clinical trial. And secondly, on pregnancy, there is a very new uh, paper which was just published about one or two weeks ago on a small number of people on parent panel. They are talking about early birth, uh, small, uh, low EDGAR, and, uh, mm, but the major malformations are not reported. Yeah, okay. Uh, how about breastfeeding, Prof? I think that was the... I don't know yeah, that. breastfeeding is a tricky question. Parent panel... As far as I remember, it came out from breast milk, but I need to check. Technically speaking, uh, a lot of times we are not too worried about breastfeeding because even though the anti drugs are excreted in breast milk, the dose are usually very small. Okay. Um, Prof, if patient have partial response, uh, in, in brackets, so i.e. reduced frequency of epilepsy with three anti-epileptics, phenytoin, capra, and epilim, is it advisable to add parampanil as addition to achieve better response? Uh, this, this, is, this is similar to what happened in the trial. When the trial was initially designed as adjunct therapy, the patients are mostly on three or four anti-epileptic drugs. And in, in those cases, we must know that the responder rate is about 30%, 30 to 40, you know, depends on the, the dose and tolerability. Yes, and you mentioned in your talk that uh, ideally you don't want to wait until two to three drugs are at, on a earlier uh, will achieve better responder rate. Mm. Um, um, Dr. Suganti, just give you a comment here. Thank you, Suganti. Mm. Presentation as usual. Okay, the next question. 
if a patient has no seizure but EEG still show frequent anti-epileptic discharges, shall we continue with the medication until the EEG normalize? Uh, in our practice, we don't treat EEG. We treat uh, seizures. But be careful, some patients, although they have no seizures, but their EEG are active, they have some other problem as well. For example, they have poor memory, they have learning difficulties. And in, in this case, they may have subtle seizures which are not noticed. Mm, that's true. Yeah. Um, there's another question. I added parampanil and seizure was controlled, but patient complained of irritability even with two milligrams. Sure, I stop from panel and try another, another. Yeah, another drugs. Mm. Uh, I have tried this before. Uh, cut down to one milligram in one of my patients, it still works. But mm. if the patient doesn't want to cut it, I advise them to take two milligram every other day. And uh, it may still useful and the rate of irritability may reduce. Technically speaking, we know that low dose as low as two milligram, uh, the rate of irritability is not that high. Have you actually maintained a patient? Because I had one patient where um, she's on quite a few drugs. Um, there are other drugs that may be added like Flobazam and all that have not been tried. But she's on this low maintenance dose. Well, she's been taking one milligram of parampanel. And uh, my hands get itchy. I just like I thought just one milligram, I probably want to take that out and give something else. Do you keep them on that one milligram? Do you think it works? Firstly, uh, one milligram is not that expensive. Secondly, uh, we judge based on the last use dose. So if the last added is parent panel, which is one milligram, and the patient respond. I think uh, we better keep. Okay. Um, Dr. Suganti uh, has a question here. Sorry. Um, what is your experience in the use of parampanel in status as bias? So there are case series, but doesn't have big uh, comparative trial. And in our patient in humanistic Malaya, we give a patient eight milligram step dose. Some studies suggest uh, 12 milligram, but I have never tried up to 12. Eight milligram can be very sedative, but if the status, uh, if the patient is already unconscious because of the status, then eight milligram uh, shouldn't cause uh, any significant side effect. And after the eight milligram stat dose, then we maintain with four milligram daily. This is what we use. And to, you know, very amazing as we, as the time, uh, when the time we consider parent panel, most of the patient already tried many other anti-epileptic drugs in status. And to our surprise, some of them respond to parent panel, but high dose. Mm. The percentage are not many, not high, but some of them respond even when they are refractory to many other drugs. Um, so five years. Um, yes, in five years. We don't have any more questions, but I do have another question for you, Prof. Um, um how about using uh, parampanel um in Severe patients with severe liver disease or severe renal impairment on dialysis, do you think that's a problem in using Prampanel? I must say that uh, my experience in this is very minimal. The trial excluded this group of patients. So in the trial, if the patient has any impaired liver enzyme, they would be excluded. Mm. So technically, uh, we know that parampanil are uh, metabolized in the liver as well. Mm. Mm. So we would want to reduce lower dose, not to say not to use, but consider lower dose in those with new impairment. Okay. Uh, uh, I have a question from uh, Dr. Farouk. As mm. parampanil works via glutamate system, 
Mm. Does it affect their cognition as balance? Um, what's that? BW um, balance GABA between and between GABA and glutamate. Important. Yes. So, uh, we know that in the glutamate system, the NMDA receptor uh, and the MPA receptor has different impact on cognitions. Those who work as or the, any, the medication uh, affect the NMDA receptors uh, can have more significant uh, cognitive impairment, whereas MPA receptor are more on the drowsiness and irritability. But whether it affect the balance or not, uh, this is what we believe. All the medications working on neurotransmitters, either they promote GABA activity or suppress glutamate activity, we are talking about a balance between excitatory or inhibitory uh, pathways. I hope that answers your question, Dr. Farouk. Um, you mentioned, I uh, don't know whether you mentioned in your talk as well, because of the side effects um, of Torampanel, I think this is just more in clinical practice because it can be given once a day. Uh, due to the side effects, do you tend to give them like at night time rather than uh, daytime in patients? Yeah, at night before sleep. Um, Some of my patients talk it at 9 o'clock when I say at night. <laughs> then from 10 o'clock onwards, they become dizzy. Yes. And then they came back and, you know, complain. I say, oh, no, no, don't take it at night. Take it, you know, before you go to bed. Some of them even have balance a problem when they get up to go to the toilet at yes. 3 to 4 a.m. When they wake up and they sit, they feel like a person walking like a bit of toxic. yeah that's why for that reason even we know that the side effect will uh you know will not feel it during the sleep we always try to start uh, a small dose as possible because they may wake up in the middle of their night, the night thank you Farouk, you're raising yeah. Yeah. yeah prof i have a question uh so as as you mentioned, like with perampanel, they they it's kind of uh, have a sedative effect or drowsy effect. Is there any uh, uh, supplement or any other uh, drug actually to, for example, if let's say certain patient where only perampanel works for them, and even in, in you know they have to take uh, take perampanel only, so it will be difficult for them to concentrate on their work because of the sedative effect. So will there be any other medication along with that that will actually support or may, may not uh, induce uh, drowsiness in, in patients? Uh, the, what we understand from pharmacokinetics is that the side effect occur correlated with the plasma level. And the plasma level is highest after the intake of parent panel within the first uh, six to eight hours, although we know that the, the half-life is uh, can go up to 72 hours. But in our patients, we realize that once the peak level is over, which is within the first six to eight, and some of the patient uh, peak, peak level lasts up to 12 hours, then the side effect will reduce. And because of that, there is a there is an advice, but I have not tried that before. Is to take more frequent, uh, but smaller dose. But I have not tried that before. So the advice, uh, to try smaller dose, but maybe BD. To achieve a smaller peak level, a lower peak level. So for example, some some patients who need six milligram, uh, we can try two milligram in the morning and uh, four milligram at night. Did, did I explain myself well? Yes, yes. So well, thank two you. and four will have a lower peak level compared to six milligram, but mm -hmm. I have not tried that before. 
Mm. I have tried that with zonisamide and zonisamide work very well. So those with uh, side effect on zonisamide, which is also daily dose, when I shift to BD, uh, it actually helps. Mm. Yeah, proper connecting question to that. So uh, what is the chronic uh, uh, treatment effect of parampatil? Is there any uh, serious or uh, other side effects which are reported with the chronic uh, treatment with parampatil? Yeah, I've not seen any. Mm, even the psychiatric effect are not uh, chronic; they are reversible. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much. So I guess um, we don't have uh, any more questions. Um, is there any other comment you'd like to talk? Um, otherwise, uh, I think um, we have reached the time that was given. Oh, hello, hold on. Um, Dr. Suganti mentioned something. Um, she wanted to share some info here. Um, I'll read it out to you. There is a case series and review of the literature in super refractory status epilepticus treated with high dose of parampanel. 32 milligram loading dose was given stat and continued with maintenance. Although I'm not too sure. I wonder what, what's the maintenance dose is. Hmm. Yes, thank you, Suganti. Yeah, super high dose uh, prime panel, but I dare not try. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, I guess um, this brings us to the end of the uh, ASI sponsored symposium today on um, uh, advances or updates on junctive treatment in epilepsy treatment. Thank you again, Professor. Lim, uh, Dr. Lim Keng Siang uh, for um, your excellent talk uh, this evening. And uh, thank you again uh, for the, uh, uh, for, uh, thank you again to the Malaysian Epilepsy Congress committee members for organizing this.